the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Welcome to this episode of Tudor's Dynasty's series on Mary I, England's first crowned queen pregnant. I am your host, Johanna Strong, and this week I am joined by a whole host of wonderful people. So we have Peter Stefel, who is currently working on a PhD. You will remember him from a few weeks ago on the podcast, and he is looking at the iconography of Mary during her lifetime. We're also joined by Melita Thomas, who is also working on a PhD, looking at the networks of Mary I before she became queen. And you'll remember her episode again from the series. We also have Linda Porter, who has written and reviewed for BBC History Magazine, The Literary Review and History Today. She's also the author of a number of historical nonfiction books, including, but not limited to, Mary Tudor, the First Queen, which also appears as the First Queen of England, the myth of Bloody Mary, with Bloody Mary in big quotes. And last, but certainly not least, we have Daniela Montgomery Logan, who lives in Winchester, Hampshire. She has just completed her BA in Medieval History at the University of Winchester and is due to start an MA at Winchester this September. She focuses on late medieval queenship and the women of the Wars of the Roses, and her dissertation focused on the gender criticism of Queen Margaret of Anjou in the late period of medieval England. So today, the five of us are going to be talking about representations of Mary I on film and television. So I think it makes the most sense if we start kind of at the relative beginning And so what we're going to do is kind of look at these different depictions, look at how Mary is represented, and then look at kind of what what this creates as a stereotype for Mary and how that changes as we get closer and closer to 2022. So the first one we are going to look at is Young Bess, and I will hand that over to Linda and Melita, who have a much better memory of this than the rest of us. So how is Mary represented in this depiction? I'm going to say I don't have a very strong memory because it came out before I was born, but it was it was based on the novel um, Young Bess by Margaret Irwin, who wrote a a trilogy of of works about um, Elizabeth, of course. And Mary is, as always, a bit player and very stereotypically uh, represented as stupid uh, nowhere near as well educated as Elizabeth, um, completely obsessed with her religion and the past and just the usual sort of um, dark, you, you know, every time every time Mary's in the scene, it's always dark and there's, you know, she, she's at her prayers or she's, you know, being um, over emotive about some sort of religious icon. It's that whole sort of dark and obscure way that she's always represented. She's never outside laughing or dancing or yeah, and that that was very much the thing in Young Bess. But Mary was depicted as um, stupid, basically, and uh, very politically naive. I don't know if that's your recollection of it, Linda. It is a long time ago, that one. Well, <laughs> interestingly enough, although I do remember parts of the film quite well, particularly the scene on the barge in the Thames, oh, yeah. um, and because at that stage of my life, because I was, I suppose I was about eight when I saw it, I, um, I didn't, I, I was a great admirer of, of Elizabeth, as probably were all, you know, female children brought up in this country at the time. I don't remember Mary being in it at all, which I think perhaps says something for my sort of level of engagement with, with the rest of the film. Um, I, I do remember Stuart Granger. I do remember Jean Simmons. As I said, I particularly remember this scene on the barge in the Thames. Um, uh, and I I also remember a Catherine Parr in, in it, but I don't remember Mary at all. So it must have been, it obviously made more of an impact on you, Melita, than it did on me, because I'm afraid, interestingly enough, I don't recall her being in it at all. I guess it's possible that I'm sort of mixing memories then, because I, I, I read the book and um, I remember the scenes that you mentioned. And I suppose it's possible, you know, how how memory is a is a slippery yeah. thing and what you think you remember and what you actually create in your own mind from a different source is um you know an interesting question but that's that's my perception of of how she was portrayed in that but maybe I'm imposing the book on the film 
No, I, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I think it, it just depends you know, what as a small child interests Mm. you at the time. I mean, it's an aside, but perhaps a not irrelevant one. I went when I was even younger to see Laurence Olivier's Richard III. And when they cut off (laughs) um, Hastings' head and you you see a woman scrubbing up the blood afterwards, my mother removed me from the cinema. I was really upset about it. So, I mean, about being removed, not about his beheading. (laughs) But I, I think, you know, as a small child, you do hone in on the things that particularly interest you. And at the time, I found the young Elizabeth a very fascinating figure. I mean, I still do. She's a very interesting figure. But whatever, however Mary was depicted in it, I'm sure you're right. She must have been in the film. I, I must have managed to block that out altogether. I think it's one of those where unless you're looking for Mary in kind of a, a film or TV show, it's very easy to kind of go, oh, well, of course she was there, but I don't remember what she was doing or I don't kind of remember the details it becomes this as you both said like she's the background figure figure in the dark and that's how we end up remembering her um which i think often is how she's portrayed in these really early representations which actually fits really well into kind of talking about lady jane with i think most of us will remember helena bonham carter before she was Harry Potter famous, was famous as Lady Jane Grey and following that storyline. And I think that, again, is, I mean, naturally kind of content-wise, but also visually, is quite a dark film. And so how is Mary represented in that? Anyone feel free to weigh in? I quite, I, it's absolutely one of my absolute all-time favourite movies. And I remember watching it, um, as a young girl and then I've sort of gone back to it over time and thought different different things as I've got more into my studies and then I watched it again last night and so many things jumped out at me it, again you definitely are seeing there's a, such a, a split division of light and dark and it is a very dark and drab film and yet it, it is nice to see Mary depicted and I think very purposely in rich fabrics and colours against Jane's um, darker clothes, sombre clothes. And it is meant to set them apart and it does that very well. And yet one thing I didn't ever pick up on until last night was some of the, the maybe the sharp lines of Mary's clothes, her hair. And the first thing that jumped out at me was almost that she resembled the costume is certainly a little bit unusual and it almost resembled the evil queen from Snow White. <laughs> um, the sharp collars and the pointiness of it all. But again, it is very clearly meant to demonstrate Jane's youth and naivety. And But it was refreshing to see Mary. She's, she's, she's an old, older lady, but, but definitely in, much more in control than other depictions of her. But it was so interesting, once again, just to see the darkness and the light. And again, quite nice to see a portrayal of affection between her and Jane, um, even up to the end with, with the coin and, and the connection between the love story between her and Philip and, and Jane and Guildford. But again, just the depiction of the good and the evil, the light and the dark. I always find that so interesting with, with Lady J. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting you bring up the use of colours and the clothing that makes a difference. And I think what's interesting in, in that depiction is normally Mary is shown as this very kind of dark figure, always wearing dark colours, which is absolutely the opposite of how she lived in life. She loved jewels. She loved games and gambling. She loved kind of that court life. And I think that's what's really special about the portrayal of her in Lady Jane is that we get this more authentic Mary, if I can phrase it like that, of we get kind of the the colors and the richness and the idea that, you know, this is the daughter of kings and she knows that. But interesting kind of to see that used as here's Jane as this kind of in massive air quotes, the ideal Protestant queen. And so she's dressed very like this is a job and I will be professional. Um, And then Mary is the very, I'm just going to wear nice things. Um, And so it's, it's quite the contrast of 
what is often seen as this Protestant work ethic and then Mary's Catholicism and and the brightness and richness of that. I was just wondering if anyone wanted to comment on that. I think, Peter, you probably have the, the <laughs> biggest knowledge of Mary's kind of ch- choice of clothing. <laughs> and so how does that fit with how she's portrayed in Lady Jane? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say I'm an expert by any means, but <laughs> um, I must confess, I only saw this film for the first time last year. And I wasn't expecting good things, but I was pleasantly surprised of how Mary's been portrayed because she's not the villain as such in this film. You do see that sense of kindness, which she did have. And, you know, when she's contemplating, what do I do about Jane after White's Rebellion? You know, I can't kill this girl. She's only a little girl. And you see her, what do I do? What do I do? And you've got the Spanish ambassador one side saying, you know, he, she's got to go. She's got to. And you understand that's the struggles of queenship. How do you protect yourself from these rebellions? But also, you know, you know she's innocent. So it's that constant struggle. And I think it's in one of the last scenes when you see Mary, she's contemplating this decision and she looks at that portrait of Philip and she says, no, I have to do what I need to do as a queen. So similar to what Elizabeth, I guess, did to Mary Queen of Scots. You know, how do you... You know, it's family one side, but your crown on the other. How do you, you know, which one do you look after? You know, and for a monarch, it has to be the, the crown comes first above all things. Um, yeah, no, in terms of the clothing, I mean, <laughs> I loved it. It was so nice. It was nice to see her in, in colour because she's, all, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but the, fur, the uh, n- newer depictions, especially with a certain film, she's always in black and she's miserable and she's, seen as that evil queen but in this depiction you know she does wear the purple she does wear other colors and we the audience suddenly realizes oh hang on she is an actual human being you know she's not this um fantastical monster or anything she's she's a real woman trying to deal with a man's world in a very effective way and i must say um this depiction does show her as a very regal woman she knows her place she knows who's in charge it's her you know, the buck stops with her. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good point. I think that's one of the kind of really interesting things. I was just looking up the actor who plays Mary is, I'm probably going to mispronounce the last name, uh, is Jane Lapoter. And I've just been looking to see kind of what else she has done. And from this depiction uh, in Lady Jane in 1986, she's then gone on to she had previously been the Empress Marie of Russia and Eleanor of Aquitaine. She'd also been Cleopatra and Lady Macbeth before these, and then went on to play multiple princesses in Downton Abbey and The Crown. So she doesn't bring this kind of regality <laughs> to this role. <laughs> she also played Jane Bennett in um, Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> I was gonna say she looks familiar, but why? That is one of the early Pride and Prejudices. <laughs> it's, it's probably because of the crown, because she plays Princess Alice. Yeah, and she really brought. You know, Absolutely. I didn't know. I didn't know a lot about Princess Alice, but once you watch that, and then obviously read up on her. It's, it's a fascinating life. It really was. Mm-hmm. And and again, she still brought that regality in that series. You know, you knew she was a princess of kings. You know, she's. It's really, yeah. She just has that sense of. There was almost a little hint of humour mm. when she played Mary and Lady Jane. And I, I kind of, there was a, that glint and that kind of control, but a little bit of humour. And I saw that in Alice in The Crown. And I mm. thought, that's where I know her from. <laughs> and you could see it again. But again, I think she must get picked to play these roles. And she does it so beautifully. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting, Joanna, that Lady Jane... I don't think it's ever been shown on TV, has it? If it has, it's very rare. I don't know whether there is some, you know, copyright or or, um, rights issue involved with that, because I think if it had been, uh, it it might have had perhaps more of an impact over time on popular perceptions of Mary, because as as you and the others have said, it is a perhaps more rounded picture, particularly with the emphasis on what it means to be a queen in, in well, not just the 16th century, but but even more so then than perhaps it does now. 
I've never understood. I've seen it. I've, someone else has raised this point in the past and I can't remember who it is, but I think it's a shame that the, the film hasn't been made more widely available because I, it, it might have played a small part in, in shifting perceptions, I think, if it had been shown on TV and repeated a few times. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it it's one of these, as you say, it provides that rounded figure, which I think is certainly unique nowadays, but was absolutely unique in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think one of the defining moments for Tudor regnant queenship is in the early 70s, Elizabeth R., where we see Mary portrayed in kind of the complete opposite way to Lady Jane. Um, so kind of backtracking a little bit to that, this is the Glenda Jackson version. And it is the the portrayal of Elizabeth as she's trying to negotiate the marriage market and trying to negotiate the diplomatic situations that she's needing to handle as queen. And obviously, these are all things that Mary did before her. And so we go from kind of this, this very, dare I say, enlightened version in the mid 80s of Mary, which is in stark contrast to kind of the preceding massive work in Elizabeth R. And so how is how do we see Mary portrayed in the shadow, unfortunately, of Elizabeth in this this early 70s? Not sure who wants to take that one. I'm I'm going to say that Elizabeth R, probably like many people of my generation, was what made me interested in in history. Elizabeth R and, and the six wives of Henry VIII. But now, when I tried to watch it recently, when I got to Portrayals of Mary, I had to turn it off. I couldn't <laughs> understand it because it's this. She's she's portrayed as barely barely off hysteria at all times. I mean, she, you can see if, if you even speak to it, she's about to completely implode or explode. And again, what I was saying before about she's always, you know excessively religiosity and you know it's all very um it's all very distasteful I found so actually I've been unable to watch it a second or a third fourth fifth fifth time recently because the portrayal of Mary was so caricature-ish that I I couldn't really cope with it so yeah that's my take on that one (laughs) what did you think Linda? (laughs) No I I agree Um, I, I started to watch it again a while ago um, interestingly enough, not not only was I very put off by the portrayal of Mary, but Glenda Jackson just looked so old to be a 15-year-old Elizabeth. <laughs> that This sort of creates a certain negativity right from the start. I mean, the, the actress who plays Elizabeth in Becoming Elizabeth is also far too old for the role, um, but we might get onto that a bit later on in the, the conversation. But I, I think it does have a... Whoever plays Elizabeth, um, it might be worth thinking about, also has a curious impact on how we react to Mary, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and incidentally, uh, someone else who perhaps is in need of a more charitable, isn't the right word, but but sort of complex portrayal in all of this is is, is Mary's nemesis, the Duke of Northumberland, <laughs> who, who, who is much more complex and interesting figure than, than he ever appears in, in, in any of these. And I think it's because these people are sort of juxtaposed with each other, isn't it? You've got Mary against Elizabeth and Northumberland against Mary, et cetera, et cetera, that the viewer immediately starts to take sides. Um, and this, this this sort of impacts on the way we, we view the entire thing. But no, I agree with you, Melissa. I, I did start to watch it again a, a couple of years ago, I think. And I thought, oh, I can't be doing with this anymore. I didn't get through to the end <laughs> at all. I think we've seen that as well with the Duke of Northumberland, um, with Joanne Paul's recent book, The House of Dudley, yeah, yeah, which yeah, I have right. finally just started. Um, but we see this kind of figures are often represented how we expect them to appear. And so Northumberland is this kind of conniving scheme in trying to take Mary down because that's what kind of we as the general public expect, because that's the narrative we've been told. And I think that's really interesting that you point that out of it it depends on how all of these figures play against each other as to how they're portrayed, which I think is is true for all of these depictions. Mm -hmm. And I think what makes Elizabeth R unique is that it it's it's everywhere. (laughs) It is everywhere. It's on TV. It's 
kind of on YouTube if you want to watch it. It is kind of the go-to. Whereas, as Linda, you've mentioned, Lady Jane is not. Uh, you have to go looking for Lady Jane in yes, order to is. find it. But if you type in kind of Elizabeth I on YouTube, Elizabeth R. will probably come up right away. And I think that's kind of something worth maybe delving into at this point is how do the stereotypes and caricatures we have of Mary impact how she is portrayed and kind of how sellable these movies and films are? Do we think kind of the traditional depictions where she's dark and dowdy and broody and just wanting a husband and kids, do those sell better perhaps than a revolutionary image of Mary. Maybe, Danny, you can take that one. It's really interesting. Um, and sort of doing the research for this and through our project for Queens on Screen, um, we found really universally that um, it does work, that that portrayal of, and that it, it doesn't particularly work um, in selling movies or TV shows unless you have that complete split between the characters. Either way, which, whichever side you're wanting to, to represent, you have to have a good and a bad. And usually it's it's com- a complete comparison and a- utter contrast between Elizabeth and Mary or in, in case of Lady Jane and, and Mary. And the audience is very quickly asked to choose which side they're on. And and I think this this darkness and this the, these sort of betrayals of Mary that have been so traditionally held. When we ask the audience, you know, uh, what do you think about the betrayals of of Mary the First that are out there? And they say, uh, which, which one was she? The the evil sister? Oh, she was the bad one. And you say, right, you know, and and actually, when we when we delved a little deeper and pushed people, they they felt that sort of newer betrayals where they perhaps had a more sympathetic view of, of Mary in things like the Tudors. They weren't too keen. We were really shocked to find that, whereas we were uh, quite happy to see new and possibly more realistic uh, portrayals of Mary because the representations of her have been so long held as as dark and very much portrayed just her religious persuasions and, and her agendas and, of course, Bloody Mary title. The viewers are so mired down in that view of her. They found it quite hard to to see her any other way, which I found really, really interesting and also quite sad, really. But also very much enjoying the emergence of some of the newer portrayals uh, from a personal perspective, just to, to try and readdress the balance. And I think, like you were saying, if people were able to have a more balanced selection of material out there if they were able to see Lady Jane perhaps it would start turning the tide a little bit on people's people's view but we we did find that these these core movies like Elizabeth R and and then later with um Kathy Burke's portrayal and Elizabeth it really did have an effect on people's memory and their their opinion of of who Mary was yeah and I think stepping kind of away from film for a second um, Linda and Melita have both published works on Mary for kind of a, a broader audience. Like, is, is that something in your minds as you're publishing kind of works for a broader audience where you need people to buy the book? Are people less willing to kind of look at Mary in a different way? Um, kind of, do you have to lure them in and then change their minds? Or do you just set out to be revolutionary and that's that? pretty much set out to do that I think because I, I mean it was my first book um when it was your first book as well wasn't it Melita so yeah. uh, uh I mean in a sense it, it it is profoundly new territory so you don't really know what to do or what to expect and and I chose Mary the first as a, a subject uh, actually having tried to get a number of books on the 18th century published and and then deciding that I needed to find a well-known figure um, who was controversial, actually. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that I, I chose Mary the First. And I didn't really have any set view of her when I started it. I mean, if anything, I suppose it would have been 
mildly towards the traditional one, though, you know, I, I would like to think that I didn't bring any particular baggage to it because um, that isn't the way I approach writing. But having said that, there is always something psychologically in you, perhaps. But uh, she had always been someone who who interested me. And I had begun um, years before to swing away from the view that the, the, the sort of Gloriana hagiography he- 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 view of, uh, of Elizabeth I. So it, it seemed to me reasonable to take a more balanced look at her sister, who was actually her first queen. So I think I was looking more at the the revolutionary side, if you like, Joanna, of of of, it, of her being the first queen. And, and into that, of course, comes much more about the woman and her act to queenship and her preparation for the role. Because one of the things I think that's so often missed about Mary, who is viewed as a sort of political ingenue and someone who didn't know what she was doing, which is completely wrong. She had had a very long apprenticeship in, in Tudor politics and to have survived that at all was actually quite an achievement. So, um, no, I, I I mean, I did set out, I think, to... to um, uh, to examine the traditional narrative uh, and and to provide a different view wherever possible. And I, I tried to provide a view, incidentally, of Northumberland as a more complex um, person, which I think has been largely overlooked, actually, though hopefully not by readers of the book. And the, the reaction to it was more positive than perhaps I'd expected it um, to be. I mean, th- there were a few people who come up with the, you know, standard, she was a horrible woman, why are you trying to defend her, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think I encountered, or if, well, of course, I wasn't on Twitter at the time. So. <laughs> in fact, in 2007, I'm not sure anyone was on Twitter, actually, were they? Because that's when it came out. So, uh, uh, but but certainly, no, I, I, I didn't have that kind of, of thing to contend with, whether I would have or not, I don't know. Um, so it, it wasn't a, a sort of day one overt um, desire, you know, I am going to change the view of this woman. It was something that, that developed more gradually. Um, but if it did go some way towards doing that, um, then obviously I was very pleased about it. Yeah. How about you, Melita? I know you have kind of write a lot about the tutors as well more generally and so is there kind of a, a movement or a pressure there um well I mean originally having watched Elizabeth R I was you know very pro Elizabeth but then I I read other, a, a, a series of novels back in the 70s about Mary by Hilda Lewis which were very well written hard to come by now but again which which had a pretty traditional view of Mary but it was more well-rounded so I, I actually became interested in Mary as a political player I suppose but then I think uh, I think with the generate with uh, Linda and Anna Whitelock's book and a lot of research done in the 2000s and the 2010s, much more nuanced picture of Mary. But I did feel there was a whole a lot of people then not this is not Linda's take on it, particularly, I don't think. But a lot of people then were saying, oh, she wasn't bloody, but she was tragic. It, you know, mm-hmm. she was she was bullied and she was browbeaten and she was, uh, you know, a pathetic character. And I thought, well. How could this pathetic character who could hardly get up in the morning, you know, how, how did she achieve what she achieved to actually overthrow Northumberland's plan and take the crown and see off Wyatt's rebellion and marry the king's mate and do all the things she wanted to do if she was this sort of tragic child who never, never got over childhood trauma? And I thought, well, hmm. so I actually wanted to look at that. And specifically, I wanted to look at how she and Henry interacted. Because he was the only, she was the only one of his children he had an adult relationship with. The others, uh, Edward and Elizabeth, were children when he died, and uh, Henry Fitzroy died at seventeen. So Mary had an adult relationship with him for a long time, as well as having been his his pet in childhood. So I did want to look at that, and I wanted to to try to see how their relationship, and then a personal one and a political one, and how those two things interacted to make Mary the the woman she became and I, I mean I think the the most telling thing about Mary and Henry is when and I, I think I might have mentioned this in my in my previous discussion so I won't cover it again actually uh, about what what he left in his will he left her money he didn't leave her land because he didn't want her to have landed power because he, he knew she would use it and so that was that was where I was going with um with that book I mean hopefully I will get back to uh, writing about uh, Mary in, in a in a later portion of her life, but um, 
I don't know if I've moved the dial at all. I don't think I've got as wide a readership as Linda, sadly. (laughs) We can all work together to get it there. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I think, as you both said, there's this kind of fascination with Bloody Mary or Tragic Mary. And kind of as as historians, we're looking at going, well, yes, but also it's in the middle. And I think that depiction, certainly for, I think, people who are probably starting their university careers right now, the Mary that they're seeing in the academic world and in this, this world of research is very different than the depictions that we grew up with. I think the the one that is probably defining for anyone born in the 1990s would be Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett, where again, Elizabeth is this powerful figure uh, and Mary just is. That she is again, like in the shadows and is is this horrible kind of sister and queen figure. Um, so Peter, wondering if you could kind of fill us in a little bit on Mary's depiction in that. <laughs> yes. Um, I just find it funny, don't isn't it? The first scene in that film, you have the burden of the three heretics, whoever they are. Um, and then it says all oh, the bloody times of Mary. And then you have that rubber stamp and saying, oh, she's, you know, she's approved those deaths. And then you go to her and she's all in black. She's miserable. She's hunched over. All of the court is black. Everyone's black. It's like, why are you wearing black? Like, it's like she's the devil. She's portrayed as the devil. And you have Philip on her right or left or whatever it is. And he obviously doesn't want to be there either. And then con- contrast that with Elizabeth when she's in the sunshine. She's wearing bright clothes. She's young, youthful. And it's just, I mean, Kathy Burke's a wonderful actress. She really is. But what are you doing? I mean, you know, Mary wasn't a large woman. <laughs> she was very thin, you know, and it's just, oh. But I, I will say the only thing I do like about that film is that last scene with Mary and Elizabeth, even though it didn't happen in real life. You can see the desperation in Mary's face. She knows everything that she's done is going to be, be reversed. And I think at that, I mean, at that moment, I did feel sorry for her because you think after everything you've gone through, it's all just going to be washed away. And I'm hoping viewers got that as well. You know, she's not, well, she is the villain in that piece, but you have to have some sympathy with her. You know, after everything that she's gone through, she then sees the daughter of Anne Boleyn, you know, as the next queen. And it's just, it's quite heartbreaking, really. Yeah, it certainly brings an aspect of, yes, she is a queen and yes, she is this figure of authority, but she is also at the end of the day kind of human and she will be kind of deeply disappointed knowing that when she dies, her life's work will probably get kind of turned over. And so I think that's, I think a a major point in shifting that focus on Mary is that she kind of becomes human in that moment. And that opens the door for, I think, the more recent portrayals where she is not good, not bad, but somewhere in between. And I know, I know that kind of Elizabeth is the defining film for kind of our generation. Um, so just wondering kind of if others want to come in on how they think that portrayal of Mary has kind of changed where the trajectory of um, screen depictions of Mary is going. I know that's a, a broad question. Oh, okay. Uh, which not... I guess. I'll say, just say one just... thing. Um, with Kathy's, you know, when she's, when she's like this, I mean, I, I know your viewers probably won't see this, but you know, she's shaking her head. She's going, ah, so, <laughs> what are you doing? She's sort of become the comical figure. You know, she's just had that phantom pregnancy and she's, they've turned it into a comedy. And it's, I do find that quite disturbing, actually. Yeah. It's a very it's... misogynistic view of yeah. a phantom pregnancy. Yes, isn't it? And there's, there's so much misogyny about Mary's health. Um, and it's all, um, she, she had, um, all sorts of health issues, but it wasn't all about her, her wandering womb, as they thought in those days. I mean, it's 
it, it's a very sort of underlying all treatments of Mary, I think, is this idea that because uh, she failed to reproduce, then she was fundamentally a, a flawed woman. And I think that's a, <laughs> even women do it as well. This sort of Mary is a failure because she had no child. Yeah, it's it's that very, I mean, it is very early modern in concept that in order to be kind of all of these traditional terms are very much in massive air quotes, but in order to be a kind of proper woman, you need to have a child. Like you need to somehow leave a tangible mark that you existed and it has to be in the form of a kid. And you think, well, not really. Elizabeth I leaves a massive mark and she doesn't have children. Mary leaves kind of for better and for worse, leaves a massive mark on history and she doesn't have children. And it's this, I think the divorcing of the monarch from the person um, where we get stuck in that kind of quicksand. But I think hopefully that is something that is changing in the more recent depictions. Um, so in our last kind of little bit, I think if we kind of talk about them together, because I think there are a lot of similarities between the Tudors and Becoming Elizabeth, especially. But we've also seen between those, we've seen Wolf Hall, um, which, of course, focuses on kind of the, the political figures outside of the royal family. Um, but I think that also portrays Mary in a, a somewhat different light. Um, and so just wondering... Maybe, Danny, if you could kind of bring us through how or why Mary is starting to change in these more recent depictions. Well, I remember watching the Tudors for the first time and I very nearly turned off um, just because of the rest of it. And I have to say, I found actually it was Mary's portrayal um, among some other some of the other queens, but Mary's portrayal in particular, that I stopped at one of the moments I was about to turn off and go, absolutely not, I can't do this, I can't go on. And I was like, oh, well, what are we seeing here? We're seeing something very different. She's young, she's fresh, she's beautifully naive, but so well represented. Um, and it really stopped me in my tracks and made me think, I do want to hear this side of her story and how nice that people are getting to see this. And I think, again, there was still that comparison. Again, they showed the, the competition between her and Anne and how they tried to show that Anne's fate and, and Mary's fate were intertwined and that they were both going to be each other's downfall one way or another, which was another interesting take on it. But I do think it was interesting that they did choose to give so much storyline to Mary in the Tudors. And that it showed so much of the early life that we haven't been seen, haven't seen before on screen. That's so much brushed, airbrushed away and that we only ever see her as the monarch on her deathbed or um, in comparison with her sister. Who And it is always depicted as light and dark. And um, it was so refreshing to see some of her her struggles and story growing up and in a much more she is given so much more of a sympathetic view and she does appear human you know and it is it does make you have some have sympathy for her um and the struggles you went through but you also do see that inner strength and determination and for once she's not depicted as stupid she clearly has political understanding and not so much of an agenda, but she she knows that she's the daughter of a king. And and again, the relationship with how they depict the sadness of not being able to be with her mother, Catherine of Aragon, on her deathbed. But I do like how they portray both of her relationships with her parents. And then moving, I think that has opened the doors to move forward to becoming Elizabeth, which I do think does has it have its problems, but it is clearly an attempt at being a much more balanced portrayal of Mary and I very much like how they show the separation of the siblings at that core early point and the viewer gets to really understand that Mary was very much on her own in one corner with nobody particularly looking after her at one point you, you see Catherine Parr saying I have my pawn in Elizabeth and you have Edward Seymour saying I have Ed uh, I have Edward um, 
And then the viewer is left to think, well, who's looking out for Mary? And then you have to really see she has to look after herself. And again, you get that sympathy for her that that it does come through with a strength and how regal she was. And I love that, that we can take some positivity from that. Yeah. Any other thoughts kind of from others on on how we have transitioned from these early portrayals in in Young Bess and Elizabeth R and moving into the Tudors of becoming Elizabeth? Um, Maybe why? Why is the public now ready for this this rounded, not easy to hate version of Mary? All down to the good work of Linda, I think. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you to say so. I'm sitting here thinking that um, I'm still not sure that they are ready for it, actually. Um, I, I think, you know, you've got, got to remember that Becoming Elizabeth is only on a, you know, a paid for channel, um, it won't be seen by an awful lot of people. In particular, it won't be seen by the kind of people that we've all been talking about and characterising, whom we, we would like to to change. You know, these are people in sort of probably 50 plus um, who, who may not have a subscription to Stars Play. And I have to say, given some of the other stuff on it, one can understand why. I uh, haven't watched The Serpent Queen yet, um, but I might take a look at it. That I. Um, Actually, at that that beginning of of it, which is uh, of uh, as Daniela has said, is 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 very striking. Um, I didn't actually feel that that Mary was sort. Of, I mean, she she is left alone, but as a woman of thirty one, um, she only uh, uh, perhaps it's because of prior knowledge, of course, thought well, this is someone who can probably uh, fend for themselves and is going to have to anyhow because their religion is is now you know no longer. Uh, uh, something which the powers that be really um, approve of. And I think one of the the things I really liked about Becoming Elizabeth, and there are a lot of things I didn't like very much, but it is that you you see um, Mary's commitment to her faith, but it's not shown as sort of shrill or neurotic. Mm-hmm. It's shown as a, an integral part of who she is and how she lives. But it, it, it is handled with with a bit more care. And I think, I mean, this is just a personal reaction. And I, I don't know what other people think. But again, if I go back to my point about how Mary and Elizabeth are so often juxtaposed as, as sort of in opposition to each other, um, uh, one of the things I found slightly strange about becoming Elizabeth is that uh, Elizabeth herself remains a rather sort of curiously vacuous figure in it, I think, at any rate. I, I mean, it may, there are various reasons for that. I mean, to be frank, it's got clunky dialogue. It goes on far too long. I mean, when I started watching it, I couldn't believe it had actually eight episodes. And it goes on and on and on in something that could have been covered more effectively and with about at least two fewer episodes. But the problem, I think, with um, people who, who might otherwise have assumed they think Elizabeth was absolutely wonderful at the end of all of this is that you get... Um, an actress who has two facial expressions, one of sort of horrible anguish and, and one of looking elated. Um, she looks much older than 14 stroke 15 years old. So the, the whole business, which is so beloved of modern hysterics about the Thomas Seymour thing, um, it becomes a total damp squib. Because if you see the two of them, you think, well, you know, why shouldn't they fancy each other, basically? Uh, but um, I mean, I know some people find this offensive, but it is very silly, the um, the emphasis that has, has been put on all of this. Uh, and certainly I would have thought that becoming Elizabeth might go some way towards minimising that a bit. But she I, I think um, um, presumably not intentionally. Um, and I have to admit, I didn't watch all of every single episode, but I did make sure I watched the bits that Mary was in. Um, and I, I thought um, Roma Ligari's portrayal of her is very, very good. And her script was good as well, whereas some of the other dialogue in it wasn't so very good. Uh, and one of the reasons, as I said to begin with, that I think she comes out as quite a uh, as a much more sympathetic character, as you're saying, that we we sort of moved towards is because um, it, I think it's actually rather a weak depiction of Elizabeth. Um, but but that's just my view. Other people may hugely disagree with that. I don't know. What do you think, Melita? Um, like you, I've only only seen edited highlights, but uh, I think 
perhaps in a way that's a better depiction of Elizabeth because there's so much reading history backwards and because Elizabeth mm. was eventually a you know a you know very a successful queen in many ways not not in every way and things weren't as good as they've been painted but she is only a, a I'm not going to say a child because as you allude to in in the times that we're talking about she was an adult at 14 yeah. or 15 but she was still only a young a young yeah, person and therefore it would be surprising and I think in a way that's where Glenda Jackson you know she was portraying an adult Elizabeth in a in a child you know a young person role and I think that gave, gave a false impression so the fact that Elizabeth is doesn't you know she's got a crush on Seymour she doesn't quite know what to do um she's sort of her, her relationship with her stepmother that she loves but now she's you know snogging her stepmother's husband so I think it's actually quite good to have her as a bit more feeble than usual <laughs> the thing about Mary in it I think and I because I, I again I think that the how the relationship between the sisters is portrayed is I, I I think again a lot of reading history backwards that they were always at odds that they were always enemies I certainly in, in Elizabeth's childhood Mary was Mary was kind to Elizabeth they, they were and I think there was probably some genuine affection there I think things went downhill I mean this this is a, a theory of mine about Elizabeth that she was in, intensely jealous of anybody that Catherine Parr was fond of because you look at the women she didn't like they were all Catherine Parr's friends and I because I think she did love Catherine and she sort of wanted her all to herself and the fact that Catherine and Mary were friends I think possibly Elizabeth as as a child was was sort of a bit jealous um and I and I think and I think the, this split in their relationship came when Elizabeth didn't support Mary in 1553 I think that probably shocked Mary mm, yeah and made her think yeah my sister who I loved and been fond of and where is she when I need her and I think she never trusted her again and of course once you don't trust somebody it all it all breaks down so I yeah so I thought the scene where Mary says to Elizabeth um don't give me the power to destroy you because I might use it I think I'm sure it never happened but I think it, it actually plays to something that actually is is true in it in its in a sense Mm, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, I think one of the, I will say this, I do not mean this vindictively, but I think one of the nicest things about becoming Elizabeth is finally all of the Elizabeth fans are feeling what we have felt about Mary's depictions for years. <laughs> is they're now going, well, that's not right. <laughs> and kind of all of the people for Mary are going, well, welcome. Like, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, um, and like, I think it's just such a a different depiction. And I'm wondering, Peter, in our kind of final moments, where do you think this will go? Kind of, are we going to get a becoming Mary? Fingers crossed. There better be a sequel after that last scene. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just funny actually when you you say becoming Mary because. I mean, you you know, and probably a lot of other people know, I was very sceptical of becoming Elizabeth when we first saw the trailer. And when it said, you know, when I first saw it, I thought, okay, no, she looks, she's ginger, she's got blue eyes, she's beautiful, that's good. But then if you looked at the subtitles, when they were naming the characters, it said Edward the Sixth, Elizabeth the First, Mary Tudor. <laughs> ah, what? <laughs> and everyone knows how angry I got about that. But then after watching it, I have to say that it is my favourite portrayal. Because Ramona yeah. does such a good job at showing, you know, she's not a fanatic. She's just a very deeply religious person, as was everyone back then. Mm. You know, you see that she's she's a survivor, Henrician court, and she's trying to teach Elizabeth, look, this is how you've got to do it. I'm trying. She's sort of like a mother figure to her. And when Elizabeth doesn't go to her house, it's sort of like, what are you doing? I'm trying to protect you because I know what what's going what's going on. And I just, yeah, I just love Ramada in this. And I do like that. It's, it's sort of, you've not really looked at much about Elizabeth in this show that's meant to be about her. It's all about mm -hmm. Edward and Mary, which is fantastic because we never really talk about them. No, that's a great point. Yeah. And I think that's, I think maybe the, the upbeat, hopeful moment to end this episode on. So having looked at how Mary has changed significantly in the history of depictions on screen. 
Um, and I want to thank everyone who has listened to this episode. And I want to thank especially Peter, Danny, Linda, and Melita in no particular order. That's just the order on my screen. I want to thank you all for joining me for this discussion about Mary. And to all our listeners, we will see you back very soon for more on Mary the First. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.